this is like talking to chat GPT, you know? You put in a prompt, you get something back, it doesn't look quite right, and you try again. So we're introducing tonight together because we first and foremost CADP, the Center for AI and Digital Policy, which aims to promote I'm, I'm thinking, I know we're supporting fundamental rights, democratic values, and the rule of law. Did I get that right? Yes. So if you remember something from tonight, it's that we are aimed to promoting AI, a human-centric approach to AI. And it is in this perspective that we have created CADP Europe, precisely because we are a turning point now policy-wise, since, as you know, actually right today, the EU Act was adopted by the Council of the EU. So now we're gearing towards uh, application. Yes, we will see. We will applaud when we manage to ensure a human-centric approach to AI through the EU AI Act and impose a rights-based approach, at least from our perspective. And I think this is a perspective also that we, are, uh, that we adopted when we tried to select AI, European AI policy leaders that will receive, which, who will receive awards tonight for their achievements with regard to the policy making process in Europe that has been taking place. So because CADP and CADP Europe always work collaboratively for uh, introducing the awards tonight, we will have our board of CADP Europe board of trustees giving uh, the awards to uh, the award recipients. A lot of awards tonight, but I think we're all here to celebrate and find a way together to ensure um, human-centric governance. Clarice Giraud? Am I supposed to be seated here? I don't think I received an award. <laughs> no, but you're in the next panel. So basically now we will have uh, the awards to the European AI policy leaders. Then we will have a panel led by, uh, moderated by uh, Gian Claudio Malgeri with Clarice Giraud from the OECD and actually myself and all of you because we would like this panel to be collaborative. And after we will have a well-deserved cocktail for all those who had to wait a bit for registration and we apologize for this. Yay, I see some clapping for that. So, without further ado, to give the award to the 2024 AI Policy Award uh, in the category of um, government, I will call uh, myself, actually, I will give it up. <laughs> And uh, we, we have awarded the, the award in governance, AI policy leader in governance, to the Garante per la protezione dei dati personali for his action with, with regards, his pioneering action with regards to uh, OpenAI, both ChatGPT, but also very recently, Sora AI. So thank you very much for your action. We're very honored to give you this award. Thank you. No, 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 it's not. In this case, I just uh, like just to add in particular, we have one of the most, I would say, uh, 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 m what, what one of the most innovative uh, members of the Garant because it was, uh, very, it did uh, very interesting things to basically try to make closer privacy to so so civil society. And this was missing in Italy. So, Guido Scorza, thank you very much. And if I may, indeed, one of the reasons why we thought it was very important to have a data protection authority here, which is pioneering in the field, is that now we have a lot of discussion as far as the EU Act is concerned regarding its governance and which authorities will be, will have, uh, will be the national market surveillance authorities. The Italian DPA has made a bid <laughs> to it to the Italian government and a renewed bid very recently. We don't know, but at CADP and CADP Europe, one of our key parameters is to ensure independent AI oversight. And this is what Guido Scorza and the Garante has been achieving. So thank you very much thank and I leave you. you. Thank you to you. <laughs> thank you to you. I'm a lawyer, I'm an Italian lawyer. Then uh, let me read something because otherwise the risk is that uh, tonight uh, we will rest uh, here. Uh, 
uh, for uh, all uh, night. Then if I read, probably I will be able to stay in, uh, to stay in uh, three or four minutes. Uh, good evening, of course. And first of all, let me say without any originality, as uh, I asked uh, ChatGPT uh, helping me to writing uh, the, uh, the speech, uh, thank you, thank you to the uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Digital uh, Policy for the prize. It's, uh, of course, an honor, and I think uh, that you can, uh, you can see my emotion, uh, receive this, uh, this prize from your organization, because as you know, uh, I know uh, very well also because some common friends, uh, the huge uh, effort uh, you did also in the past in the field of digital policy, privacy, and now artificial intelligence. As I often remember at the beginning of uh, my uh, speech, I'm only a quarter of uh, the Italian Data Protection uh, Authority. And then uh, tonight, uh, receiving this, uh, this prize, uh, let me uh, remember that uh, uh, having this prize uh, would be simply impossible without the work of uh, the extraordinary women and men working at, uh, the, uh, at the Galante. But uh, uh, let me add that uh, we could never have done and uh, will not be able to do uh, the little that we did uh, also in the field of artificial intelligence. Of course, in my opinion, if uh, in the history, uh, or if the history of uh, the Garante, of the Italian Data Protection uh, Authority had not intersected uh, the uh, history of two extraordinary men uh, who are not uh, 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 longer uh, with, uh, with, uh, with us. I'm speaking about uh, Stefano Rodotà and Giovanni Buttarelli. And uh, let me say that probably this prize uh, is uh, more for uh, Stefano and for uh, Giovanni than uh, for, uh, for us. I had the luck to be friend uh, of both, and uh, I had the luck uh, to spend many times with Stefano and with uh, Giovanni, uh, and uh, I had uh, the occasion uh, to, to learn, also if at the end I, I'm not learning uh, everything, uh, there are extraordinary ability to understand when we have to leave innovation, running free of uh, any kind of regulation or uh, enforcement intervention, and when, on the contrary, we need to intervene, not for stopping uh, innovation, because that's normally useless and very, very difficult. Uh, but uh, to orienting innovation in the better direction, and the better direction, in uh, my personal opinion, is always the same, improving the human uh, well-being for the most part of humanity. That's, in my opinion, the, ca the case uh, about the impact uh, of artificial intelligence on society. And that was, and still is, because our investigation on open AI is still open, uh, the case of uh, our intervention on child GPT, uh, not against, but uh, on respect uh, on uh, open AI. Uh, because I'm sure uh, that uh, we can't consider uh, open AI uh, and, of course, the other artificial intelligence uh, providers uh, as enemies or as antagonists, uh, but uh, simply as stakeholders uh, of different uh, interests, lawful until uh, proven uh, otherwise, to be balanced with other interests. In our case, the other interests uh, are, of course, uh, fundamental rights, freedoms, and uh, first of all, uh, in my case, uh, privacy. Uh, we need to build the best sustainable future together, and in my opinion, uh, no one between us can do it uh, alone. Then uh, I can't imagine a future for uh, my daughters uh, without tech innovation, but at the same time, I can't imagine a future for my daughters uh, without uh, uh, fundamental rights and freedom, and I don't like to imagine a future for my daughters uh, without fundamental rights and, and freedom. 
Uh, luckily, uh, Stefano and uh, Giovanni reminded us very, very often that we have tyrants' uh, rights here in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, at least, uh, and uh, also privacy uh, isn't an absolute right. And that we always need balancing uh, between uh, two only appearing rivals' uh, rights. And the balancing algorithm, in my opinion, is always the same. We need to compress, not erase, not cancel, we need to compress a right in the minimum measure necessary to guarantee the exercise of uh, the uh, other. That's the case, in my opinion, between the right to innovate and the right to privacy. Uh, we as an institution, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, we must avoid asking people to choose between innovation and uh, privacy. Because the most important right that we as institution, we have to guarantee to people is exactly the right not to have to choose between uh, two or more uh, fundamental rights. Here let me simply uh, say to conclude that in my opinion, if uh, we move uh, from the principle that innovation isn't less important than privacy, and then privacy isn't less important than innovation, at the end, we can find a way uh, to manage this kind of problem. But if someone is thinking that uh, uh, because the enormous opportunities that artificial intelligence or today or tomorrow or some other technologies is able to offer to uh, society, we need to give to it a general uh, green light also at the cost to sacrifice some fundamental uh, rights, starting from privacy. Let me only remember that in democracy, the scope doesn't justify any times the means. And that, uh, as Stefano Rodotà said very, very often, we need refusing the principle that everything is uh, uh, technologically possible is also to be considered legally legitimate and democratically sustainable. This is, in my opinion, more important today because we live in uh, an age in which uh, uh, we, we haven't anymore anything technologically uh, impossible. Then uh, many thanks again for your prize and uh, uh, you can be sure uh, that we will use it uh, uh, to, uh, as a, an incentive to do uh, better and more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. So actually, uh, at CADP, we are running um, AI policy clinics. It's a free clinic open to all. So we try to put together all um, uh, like-minded people or those who want to know more about a human-centric approach to AI. And at first promotion, was called the Giovanni Buttarelli promotion. So thank you very much for mentioning him, uh, his visionary role, and also Stefano Rodotta. Without further ado, we will go to the second award. So it will be, it's a twin award to actually two Italians. Okay, I promise you that it is a coincidence that some of our awardees tonight are Italians. There are Italians from Italy, there are Italians from Brussels, there are people in other institutions. It is just awards based on merits. So for this uh, next award, it's the awards in uh, um, AI policy leader in academia. And what we looked at as a criteria is what we call in academia a post-critical approach. Oh, oh, a big word, shit. So what does that mean? It means basically was that we shouldn't just criticize the state of play. We should try to find solutions. And we believe that the two awardees manage just this with their work towards ensuring that there is a fundamental rights impact assessment in the EU Act. And to deliver these awards, we couldn't find any better person than our than our Board of Trustees member, Ursula Parel. She's, both, she's a great friend of CIDP. She's a board member of CIDP and a board member of CIDP Europe. She's a 
professional, uh, an expert in consumer digital rights, one of the best in Europe. And thank you very much for the, your presence tonight and for your always wonderful support. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karine. Thank you for this kind introduction, but I think today it's more about our awardees. And as uh, Karine said, it's a twin award. Uh, it's um, uh, the academic award. So on behalf of CIDP Europe, I have the deep honor and real pleasure to hand it over to Professors uh, Gian Claudio Malgeri and to Professor Alessandro Mantelero. <laughs> yeah. Oops, they are really heavy. Alessandro, it's your name is on it, so it has to be this one. And Jean Claudio. Well, thank you very much again. We have to make a picture, yeah, apparently. <laughs> thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, for your successful and relentless work, as Karin said, on the inclusion of a fundamental rights impact assessment into the EU AI Act. And without further ado, I think maybe you want to express yourself on this occasion. Please. Thank you, thank you very much for this hour. Thank you to uh, DP for that. And I want to just mention that uh, the initiative that we have carried out uh, uh, with regard to the fundamental rights impact assessment was just not our uh, initiative, but we also involved Vincenzo Tiani and Vincenzo gave us a lot of support in the result and in the achievement in terms of pressure on the, the policy maker in regarding the introduction of fundamental rights impact assessment. Uh, I want also to say just a brief comment. I think that uh, this Harvard is not just um, for me or for Jean Claudio, but I think it's a, 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 an hour for all the academics that have decided to remain independent. I think this is a very important point because more and more companies uh, provide a lot of funds, a lot of visibility to many academics that decide to work close to the companies and to their interests. Of course, this is a big issue when the same academics that are involved in the policy making and in supporting EU institutions. So I think it's very important to be aware about this sort of unfair competition on one hand from academic perspective, and also to be aware from the side of European institution that uh, it's not just enough uh, in terms of involving academics uh, to select people that come from the academia, but it would be also nice to consider what their background, what are their interests, and what are their relationship. Of course, we are free to have any kind of relationship and also with the company, private or a public entity, but it's an element. The independence of academia when provide advice to policymakers is something that we have to keep in mind and to preserve. Without this kind of independence, it's very difficult to provide advice that are uh, not influenced by specific interests. So for this reason, I hope that this Harvard is for all the students, PhD students and young researchers that want to invest more in this activity of policy making, focusing on the independence of the academia in order to provide uh, advice for interest, for general interest and not for particular interest. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Yeah, it, it's heavy, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just adding, uh, Alessandro already said the most important things. I would just add uh, two more things, uh, complementing, but actually endorsing what he said. Uh, so again, uh, yeah, uh, some uh, 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 thanks. So first, thanks to Vincenzo, but also thanks to the, um, he, Alessandro mentioned academic freedom. So thanks to the academic institutions that allowed uh, uh, freedom, so in, in my case, uh, the Brussels Privacy Hub and the Leiden uh, ELO Center, <laughs> and in particular because, as Alessandro said, um, I think there's a problem in the uh, narrative, hmm? in the narrative of uh, um, uh, policy making. So academia usually is not really taking steps in, uh, in the narrative. Uh, we sent, uh, uh, so and, and we indeed need to uh, thank the 160 people that signed uh, the letter for uh, the fundamental right impact assessment, saying that this is just uh, an additional follow-up to the amazing work that uh, NGOs did, and uh, there will be another award for NGO, for Adri, and thanks to the Italian uh, co-rapporteur, uh, I see Laura Caroli here for listening to uh, NGOs and to academia. Uh, so, uh, but, but just to, to, to add one thing on that, I would like to say that we received 
uh, uh, many replies, so some were enthusiastic, others said, one said, I think the role of academia is not to take action in policy, okay? Um, and it's a, it's a very fair point, uh, but, there is a but, the narrative in policy making, it's dominated by industrial interests, we know that. Uh, NGOs are underfunded and their voice is uh, either pushed by you know, uh, uh, good uh, wheels <laughs> of uh, organizers of events and conferences, or they're underrepresented. Academia <coughs> is independent, it has some money, some funding. So it's up to us to decide whether to be influenced by who already has the money to influence the discussion, or to stand up for, for uh, fundamental rights, individual rights, vulnerabilities, the ones that don't have funding, and the ones that uh, have just uh, perhaps NGOs to represent them, which is great, but it's not uh, enough to rebalance the big uh, discussion uh, lobbying. So thank you again for this uh, recognition to the academic in uh, the policy uh, making. <laughs> thank you very much to the two of you. Actually, CADP and CADP Europe have a tradition to work together with all uh, willing parties who are, um, have their goal of ensuring human-centric uh, governance. We did it, for example, with regard to the Council of Europe Convention on AI, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law. We did a call with in uh, three or four, uh, for, for, uh, with the Council of Europe negotiators, with the, for the EU and EU member states in the US and Canada, and we associated more than 400 academics and civil society organizations because we think this is a global issue and we have to tackle it together. Academics can give us the input of their objective research because this is what we need. We need facts, we need research, and as civil society, we can also carry the voice of those who are underrepresented, underrepresented and give it a policy, uh, give it more policy impact to their ideas. So thank you very much. And I must stay on top of that because I have another hat. I'm the editor-in-chief of the European Law Journal. It's one of the main journals in the field of EU law and actually in support of all the academics who are working on the issues. And I must tell you that we receive a lot of papers, actually, which you immediately see have been influenced by industries. We would publish them if at all they were good. We would publish them in a debate. But often wise, when we're surprised about something, we look at the source, and unfortunately, we always find this, the same source of funding. So this is a huge issue in academia and this is why at the beginning of the year we issued a special issue it's a double issue on law and the common good in the digital era where are though with academics who are standing up to precisely voicing um, an, a human-centric point of view because they are underrepresented in academia and we should support them. So thank you very much for your action. Without further ado, we will go to the next award. Actually, it's to another civil society organization. We have been witnessing their work. It has been absolutely fantastic. It's the European Digital Rights. Edri, Ella, please, thank you very much. Um, it is it is for the campaign on, uh, on uh, facial recognition, so thank you. And the, the board of trustees who will give this award is Emilio De Capitani. Emilio De Capitani was the head of the, sec of the Libe Committee secretary and he's the head of the free group. And national surveillance is one of his key topics, so we thought that the award should come from him. Moreover, I was a, a good friend of Joe McNamee when we were accomplice in during the negotiation of the most important uh, European legislation on transparency and on data protection. So in the both sides of uh, informational self-determination. So I am so happy and proud to give you this uh, prize. Un altro? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this award. And we say this on behalf of millions of people who supported our actions. For those of you who don't remember, the Reclaim Your Face campaign started during a pandemic. 
when gatherings uh, like these, any sort of offline gathering was impossible. Organizing a campaign is difficult in those contexts. Um, but despite this difficulty, our movement managed to coordinate collective actions, to analyze legal te texts, to expose technical harm, and to bring the voice of masses, millions of people from all over the world to Brussels, the epicenter of EU decision making. Together, we created a horizontal, broad public debate on the need to ban biometric mass surveillance, both in law, but also in practice. We were over 110 human rights organizations from over 25 member states. We were activists, we were LGBTQI uh, supporters, we were lawyers, technologists, academics, we were students, artists, parents. Together, we represented over a million people. And we took action both at local and municipal level, but also national level and of course, EU level. And because we were in a pandemic, we had to be creative with our actions, but also strategic. We had to decentralize our actions, but we spoke together in a unified voice, calling at all times for a ban. And this prize is based, like I mentioned, on the work of millions, on the work of volunteers, on the work of groups that gathered at night, online, <laughs> sweating and crying, and sometimes also laughing together. As the AI Act enters its implementation phase, we don't stop, we go on. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so I've worked on this Reclaim Your Face campaign since my first days at EDRI. Um, so this feels very personal, but at the same time, as my colleague Andrea has said, this movement, the Reclaim Your Face movement, belongs to so many people, including several of the people here in this room tonight. And the fight that we have put up as a campaign really highlights the power of people and the power of democracy against state overreach and against the interests of, in particular, the surveillance industry. So to be recognized for this fight um, is really, really meaningful for us. Biometric mass surveillance, whether that's facial recognition or other forms of treating people as effectively walking barcodes, um, is a really good example of why we need data protection. Um, we've seen so many fundamental human rights be impacted, violated by these practices, and we've also seen the harms of these practices disproportionately distributed against minoritized and racialized people, those who were already pushed the most to the margins of society. So we especially want to give thanks not only to everyone that took part in the movement, but also to those in the parliament, the commission, and even in a couple of member states who took our demands seriously, who listened to us, um, and did, who did everything that they could to make our demands a reality. As we heard already, the final AI Act was, it reached its final hurdle earlier today in the Telecoms Council. We don't love everything about it. Um, it's not been everything that we had demanded, yet at the same time, it gives us a lot of opportunities moving forward, and we can really see how much of a, of a mark the Reclaim Your Face campaign and our allies, our political allies, were able to have on that law, because we also saw the size of the fight um, from the surveillance industrial complex industry on the other side. So we're really grateful for where it's landed. And we see that it gives us a lot to keep on fighting against biometric mass surveillance. So we're gonna be continuing to mobilize for full bans against mass facial recognition and other biometric identification in public spaces in all 27 EU member states. We're going to be continuing to mobilize against all emotion recognition and of course, all the other parts of the AI Act that we want to continually strengthen and improve as well. So we hope that we can count on our political allies moving forward because we know that our digital rights are constantly under threat. Um, and you will see actually in your conference bags, a flyer from Edri where we're showing off our manifesto, which is our positive vision for people, democracy and planet, which includes 
eliminating biometric mass surveillance and many other things beside. And I will close by just saying thank you for this honor on behalf of all of our office, all of our members, and the millions of people who've made up this movement. Thank you. So thank you very much for your work and we will look forward to continue our collaboration with you and all those who want to fight against a, a carve-out and exemption with regard to national security. In the meantime, Emilio talked about transparency and actually the last awards is supposed to be in the business category and if we put journalism in the business categories, this would fit, we wouldn't see these 2024 awards without having one for Luca Bertuzzi. In the age of disinformation, where journalism, fact-based journalism is uh, at threat, Luca Bertuzzi managed to ensure transparency and democratic, uh, a real democratic process. Because let's be honest, if you wanted to know where we stand with the EU Act, you had to click on uh, Lucas LinkedIn profile or its Twitter and you would know where we stand. With the Council of Europe Convention on AI, it was the same. But jokes apart, thank you very much for your action. And to give this award tonight, we wouldn't think about any, anyone else than Oreste Policino. Oreste Policino has been uh, one of the mastermind behind uh, disinformation policy at EU level, and he's also a professor at University of Bocconi. So thank you, Oreste. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, now, now the stage is it's for Luca. Just let me remind you that uh, transparency is uh, encapsulated in Article 1 also among many other uh, provisions of, uh, of the Treaty of European Union. The, the Union should take its decisions more openly and close to the citizens. It was exactly what Luca managed to do in, during a negotiation that was as usually, and uh, Emilio can say something about it in the in the trilogue, not exactly the most transparent for many reasons. And Luca did exactly this work that is a hard work, uh, finding the re reliable source and trying to basically ma make closer the European uh, uh, decision -making, making to civil society. And this is something that is priceless. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much, Oreste, Karine, Mark, and everyone involved uh, for in the organization of this award. I'll try to be brief. Um, so, the AI Act was presented two days uh, since I started my job at Euractiv. So, it has accompanied me uh, throughout my journalistic career so far, and I think uh, I consider it a milestone. Uh, in my career, and I think that uh, this award is a nice uh, recognition of that. And, and I learned a lot um, covering the AI Act. And uh, one of the main things I learned is indeed that it might sound strange to be said at a data pri and, uh, privacy conference, but you know, lawmaking is not a private affair. It's done by public officials, um, elected officials, uh, in some cases, not all, um, that should be held accountable. Um, so, you know, as we are heading toward elections, um, policymakers cannot complain that there is a feeling of detachment between the citizens and the uh, uh, European Union. And then when there is something as important as the AI Act at stake, they're like, there is nothing to see here, please go away. So, you know, when we talk about um, the democratic deficit that there is uh, at the EU level, we should be talking especially about the trilogue process. Because it's, it's really incredible that we have rules, uh, amendments that are published, positions that are published, until the trilogue, and then afterwards is the far west you only get the final text when it's agreed, so it's too late. So I think, you know, um, 
if we look at things in perspective, uh, especially in recent years, um, the media have acquired a more prominent role in policy making. And I mean the media at large. I mean, we see commissioners announcing decisions on Twitter rather than official channels. We see every meeting becoming a photo opportunity. So the risk of this is that journalists become followers. And that's not how I see my role. I, in fact, I think that right now, policy reporters are not only spectators of the policy making process, they are actors with enough consistency, with enough uh, sourcing and you know, insightful coverage. Uh, a, a journalist can build, uh, can become a point of reference and influence uh, the process by applying public pressure. And you know, uh, that's also what I've tried to do um, in the AI Act. And you know, this also comes, power also comes with responsibility and that means you know, resisting uh, certain incentives that you also have in the media space like uh, clickbait or uh, horse uh, racing frames. And you know, uh, this is, uh, this is how I always try to uh, interpret my role, and I hope uh, you know I'll nudge uh, my colleagues to do the same. Even though what we are seeing is that more and more of the uh, policy coverage is moving behind paywalls, so that sort of transparency is now shutting down. But when I talk about responsibility, I think you know uh, journalists also have a responsibility toward themselves. Um, you know, uh, mental health, for instance, is not something that is really discussed enough in this industry, especially with social media, we're expected to work around the clock. And, you know, we also have a responsibility uh, to our family. So, uh, to conclude, I'd like to dedicate uh, this award to my wife, who supported me. <laughs> who supported me uh, you know, during the sleepless night uh, following the AA Act, um, trilogues especially, and to our daughter, Ambra. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that without further ado, we will close this ceremony. Thank you all for your participation. With that, uh, we will now move on to the panel, which will be moderated by John Claudio uh, Malgeri. But I will give the floor to Thierry van der Bouchon to start the discussion. Yes, thank you. Well, um, there will be a panel indeed, but first we'll make uh, we'll make a artistic uh, pit stop. Um, um, uh, so uh, since 2019, I have been. Uh, Organizing uh, CPDP first uh, uh, together with Rosa Munde van Braco, uh, then uh, with uh, Bianca Marsu, uh, who is also here uh, this year, um, together with uh, an incredible team. Um, but uh, voila, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, what uh, what I have been doing since 2019 was uh, uh, annually working with artists uh, to create uh, the cover image uh, of um, CPDP. Um, uh, last year it was Judith Fiegel um, uh, who made a very poetic work, Resistors, which, is, uh, which were drawings of uh, resistors which uh, proved that uh, already in the hardware there is resistance uh, or uh, um, um, voila. Uh, beautiful work. Um, we were, we worked with uh, Taitzel Tikalas, uh, Romanian um, artist, uh, uh, who visualized uh, the voices of um, uh, uh, in the work. I'm sorry. Uh, she visualized the voice of uh, a CEO who said uh, apolog who apologized uh, for a data breach. Um, uh, also a beautiful poetic work. We worked with David Shrigley um, uh, with um, uh, a work called Particles of Truth, also uh, uh, excellent work. But this year, um, I'm very happy uh, and honored uh, that uh, we could work together uh, with uh, Vladan Yoder, um, who's going to talk now uh, about his work. Um, voilà. Vladan, the floor is yours. OK, 
Okay. Um, hi, my name is Vladan Joler. Uh, I'm basically, uh, okay, I'm a professor at the uni University of Arts in Novi Sad. And, but I'm also founder of one organization that's m that is a member of EDRI, so I'm also like cheering for this vic victory today. UPA. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm, but mostly, okay, even I'm kind of academic and, and, and working in that field, I'm usually seeing myself more as a, some kind of detective than uh, anything else. But I'm going to present you today, and maybe it's going to be a bit intensive in the sense of like what you're going to see in next half an hour, 40 minutes maybe. It's a lot of black maps, but I will try to make this like a easy for you and, and try to, to explain you some stories behind. So this is this one here. I will, I will start with this one because maybe some of you are familiar with that one. Th this one it's called Anatomy of an AI System. Uh, so I did th this one in, in together with Kate Crawford. In we published this in 2018. And, and why I'm going to start with this one because this one it's maybe really good some kind of like a portal to all of other maps that I'm going to show. So, so during the last 10 years, basically, we started with some kind of investigations within Share Lab and Share Foundation, basically trying to help investigative journalists, online media, and, and in cases of cyber attacks. And, and, and basically doing that, I started to be involved in some kind of visualizing those spaces. And this is how this story uh, uh, basically started. But it was always coming from this position, from the position of, of let's say, a uh, uh, user and, or, or, or someone who is outside of this black box. No? So in that sense, all of those maps that they're going to see today, they, they, they are someti sometimes called as a counter cartography. So it's not what is why, why it's called counter cartography because usually cartography is coming from the position of power you know like this is my land this is my company this is how you know my network look like and so on and and the maps that i'm doing are coming from the position outside so all of them are made as a, some kind of investigation of someone who is outside of the black box or outside of the company that i'm investigating so this map is, is basically investigation of one system and, and one device that it's called uh, uh, Amazon Echo. So we did it like long time ago in 2018. So that was like some kind of trendy device back then. No? But but the idea was like why it's called uh, anatomy of an AI. It's, it's because like usually this device that we have in our hands, this is just some kind of interface. This is, you know, nothing. It's several microphones and, 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 and stuff. And basically the real body of this system, it's, it's, it's much bigger, it, it's much longer. And this is what is represented in this map. It's some kind of extended anatomy of one simple device. Because like, uh, uh, basically if you start to follow, and this is what we were like doing uh, uh, for many years, if you start to follow what's going, what's going out from this device, then you're starting some journey, you know? You're, you're going to some kind of journey into the unknown. And the thing is like, Every step you are investigating, you are seeing another layer of untransparency. You, know? you are seeing another hidden layer of, of something. So, so basically what we started, for example, this investigation, it's like to open this device. And then even there on this level, and uh, probably you, you know all of this story better than me, you know, there is a lot of problems. You, know? you are not even in many cases like being able to open device and, and the reason why you know, like all of those like Apple devices have this really wonderful uh, pentalobe screws. It's not aesthetics, it's about you to preventing you to open device, you know. And then more you go, even on this level, even, even this object is the last thing that we own. Even there we have like many, many different obstacles. So for example, things related to right to repair or, or, or I was really shocked to, to find out that it's even illegally to own uh, and it's really hard to find uh, the blueprints of many devices. And then I was, I needed to find those blueprints of devices on some kind of shady Chinese and Russian websites and so on and so on. So even there, this device, it's the last thing that we own, we are not able to get inside of it. You know? 
So, and, but, but then the, this is just the beginning of the story, you know? So the next step, it's a router. When you cross the router, you, 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 know, you can do whatever you want to do on this, with this router. So for example, to, to try to do some sniffing, to try to see the packets and try to follow the packets and so on and so on. So this is where our journey begins. And, and, and then basically I was doing like step by step investigations of, of, of those different layers. So for example, this is one of them. And this is the, the, the basically the first map. I will try to open the, the big one. Uh, so basically this is the first drawing that I, uh, that I did and this represents just one internet service provider in Serbia as a part of this journey into the unknown. No? So, but if you zoom in, then you, you, you know, this is some kind of world that I was investigating, the, the, how those networks looks like. And, and, and I was like really obsessed with this idea that behind each of those dots, each of those dots have a, uh, uh, some form of power. You know? So each of those dots have a power to, to look the data that is going through this dot. Each of those dots have a power to stop data flowing. Each of those dots can make something acceptable and not. And this, this, this in the beginning, I was like really, because I, this is something that I wanted to do for a long time, basically, to do this kind of like from early 2000, maybe 2002 or three, when I first time saw the, the, the network topography maps, I was like, I wanted to do that. But Later, I find a way how to do it with friends of mine because I was like then working with cyber forensics with with lots of people who really know something. And then once we were able to see the image, then the the story for me, the question for me is how I can read this image. What kind of you know what how I can understand what's going on behind this? How I can read what this big uh, uh, centralization of, of 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 within the networks it means? No. And, and so we step by step basically investigated, we started with this some kind of like really story about following one single internet packet, but we were like going deeper and deeper and deeper into those uh, 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 territories. And for each of them, you basically need a different type kind of like investigation method, you know, like so for example, for this you're doing trace routing, then you're doing many different things. and then. When you follow this internet packet, you come to the next uh, uh, big place there, and it's basically a data center. So there, there, then we were like part of this kind of artist, you know, th there is some kind of artistic scene in, in which we are completely obsessed about data centers and going around and trying to get inside, trying to measure how many electricity come in, how many, um, I don't know, like uh, water consumption and so on and so on. But this is another layer of investigation. So we, in, in order, to, for example, to follow all of those places, we learn how to use, I don't know, Google Maps and how to recognize different data centers looking from the, the satellites, how to, to find the location where they are, how to learn, you know, to, to investigate basically, I don't know, different kinds of like uh, reports and so on and so on. And, and so in a sense, in order to make this map, just this one line here in the middle, this big fat white one, I, we, we, sp we were spending like five years of different investigation, learning how to go step by step into and, and, and to see basically those territories that are behind. Because of all of this we are doing from our homes. No? And then in one moment we, we said, okay, let's do the big one, no? let's, let's do the, the and, and that, that was like, I think, in 2014. So this, this was like before when this algorithmic transparency was even a thing on conferences like this, much before, no? So there is like 10 years ago. Uh, mm, so we, we started some kind of investigation of how we can investigate now basically what's going on within this data center. And, and, and in order, because for, for, for me, you know, this, uh, I really wanted all the time to understand because this is something that I didn't under understood like, you, you know, from end of 90s, basically, you know, how those, you know, you, you are seeing websites, 
web websites that are like being sold or platforms for millions back then or now trillions, what, uh, whatever. But what is exactly a business model? And now we maybe know more about it. But in a way, I was like back then really obsessed with the idea of like a factory, you know, how this factory look like. So then we started to investigate uh, uh, Facebook as a platform and, and in order to do that, so on the left side, it's what is going inside of this system, on the right side, what is going outside, what is basically a product. So on the right side, it's a product. On the left side is a, uh, let's say, resource. And as a resource, it's everything that we do, everything that we touch online, like like, share, whatever, check in or so on, so on. So we again, find a way how to scrape all of those like uh, uh, interfaces, how to, to scrape different things. And then in order to understand what's going on in, in between, we used, uh, uh, we found, so we tried a lot of different things, you know, to, to do some kind of reverse engineering, to do some kind of measuring or whatever. But at the end we found uh, uh, patents to be like really helpful in order to do that. So we created some kind of like, uh, mosaic out of reading of ar around 8,000 patents. So we created this mosaic in which we, based on patents, try to understand how, you know, information is being logged, how it's being stored, how it's being organized. Uh, and then at the end, how then different algorithms are basically crawling on top of this new territory, basically that is social graph, how these algorithms are going around and how what, what they're extracting out of it. At the end is basically how they are, what is the product of this? It's this, this is the different types of targeting that we were able to detect. Uh, and it was like really, really super, um, let's say, exciting to do that. And back then I was like really thinking about myself as a, some kind of detective doing all of those things. And it was like really wonderful, but in a way, all of this, it's, it's, it, it, you know, there is something really naive in this uh, uh, because it's really not possible, you know? So in a way, in order to make this drawing, we spent like one or two years. And the system that we were analyzing was, is changing on the level of seconds or minutes. So this is this, so in a way, you, you know in the beginning that what you are investigating and what you are seeing, it's not real. But it's still, I think it's still only map of some algorithmic process on, on, on that scale. And, and, and what is like really, and, and so that was like before this kind of when this algorithmic transparency became hype. You know? and, and I think some of those maps and some of the, those crazy stories that we, we did, did influence, you know, so it was used back then from many different, you know, policy organization to scare other people and to show them how this is complex and, and these maps are hanging in, in many strange places, including some of here in, in Brussels. In, in so, it, never mind. Uh, so, but, but w there is something, something strange about this, you know. Uh, in a way, I realized that, that this kind of like idea that you as a someone who is like independent and investigating something can do this, it's completely crazy. Uh, but in a, in a way, I still believe that it is important to create maps like this. Because at the end, you know, how you're going to, to communicate this kind of complexity, how we are going to communicate complexity or, or transparency. I, I still think that maps are one of the rare ways to do that because through maps you can communicate complexity, you can tell many more things by, than by reading some text that have thousands and thousands of pages. No? So in a sense, even I know all the time that, that, that you know, all this map, it's, it's probably like you are going through the wood with uh, some kind of torch. No? And it's like you are just like seeing some shapes of the, some trees, but at the end you are not seeing the whole woods. But it's still one of the rare uh, uh, maps of this system that exists. So let's go back to anatomy, no? So we are now here somewhere. We, we now investigated what's going on inside of the, the, the um, this one factory or, or, or data center and try to get into those like systems. So, so but, but in a way the story goes 
what I understood by doing, for example, anatomy is, is that basically that, that this is one n-dimensional uh, uh, system, not just this, like many of those systems are n-dimensional. So for example, even if, if you just follow this story about like one packet and then you come here, from here you can go in completely different direction. No? So for example, this, this uh, uh, Wi-Fi router or data center or, or whatever, whatever we are uh, investigating, it's not just part of one system, it's part of many systems. So for example, this data center is connected to, I don't know, electricity. And if you go from this point, from that crossroad into the direction of electricity, then the story go goes another way. So then you are following some kind of networks of, of, of like uh, electricity distribution and, and going further and further and you, you will end up at the end probably in some kind of like coal mine in Serbia or wherever this thing is being digged. So then I understood, you know, like all of those maps, they, they are some kind of n-dimensional uh, narratives and n-dimensional stories and we are not speaking just about one system. We are speaking about many systems that are interlaced, no? that, are, that are like combined together. And, and, and so for example, if you just follow, you know, if, even if you are able to understand, okay, this is, for example, in the case of, of Amazon Alexa, this is the model that I'm interested in and so on, whatever. If you, if you follow that story and go into history of that object, of one model, that then you are a, uh, ending up in some kind of AI training process, then you are ending up in, in collection of uh, data, of, of, of like all the books and, and, and everything. You are seeing some kind of labor or, or whatever that is hidden back then. So basically, this is just like this middle of, of the map, and this middle of the map uh, uh, so basically this map is combined, uh, made of like three different parts. One is birth, life, and on the right side is death of one device. And so how this birth became part of this map? It's because of one book from, from UC Parika that it's called uh, Geology of Media. Probably some of you, you read that one. No? Uh, and, and so for example, if, if we think about this middle of the map, this is kind of classical, uh, uh, this Mar Marshall McLuhan thingy, you know, like it's like extend extension of your senses. So for example, camera, it's basic camera on the football field that is transmitting the live TV game is basically extension of our senses, no? But you see Parika is speaking in different way. He's speaking uh, uh, about media as extension of earth. And, and then the story became completely different because like if you turn back the, I don't know, clock time, all of those devices that we investigate and go over all of those like infrastructures were basically different kinds of rocks and metals like 40, 50 years ago. And then if you start your story from there, you are again starting from like periodic system of elements and each of those elements have its own story. You know, you can, one it's starting from Congo, another one from China, another one from I don't know where. And, and basically in one, each of those devices, you have like two thirds, uh, uh, three quarter of a periodic system of elements. And in order, when you start to, to look from that angle and start your investigation from the elements, not from the networks, then the story became completely different. It is about exploitation, it is about human labor, it is about like many different things that we usually don't address on the, on the events like this, you know, because for years I was just like privacy, security, data, whatever, but once I started to look at those systems from the point of uh, 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 Earth, uh, it, the story became completely different. But what is super interesting is it's that, you know, then we start to investigate those like supply chains. And then you understand, when you go deep into it, you understand that, that they are basically black boxes in the same way that, that uh, uh, networks, data centers, algorithms, or, or AI, it's a black box. Supply chains are also black boxes that is really, really hard to investigate. So for example, a few months ago, we, we investigated uh, NVIDIA supply chain, and we scraped some kind of like really obscure 
website for supply chain management and whatever, and we got like table that have two million rows of different actors, different companies that are basically supplier of supplier of supplier. And it's really hard basically to, to, to follow that, to, to investigate that. But what you are for sure seeing in each of those steps is basically exploitation of earth, exploitation of human labor, because all of those systems of creation of those devices are built on, uh, on uh, exploitation, are bu built basically on the, s on the inequality. So we then try to map all of those like different jobs that people are doing in different places and, and created this like scale in which, you know, like many parts of supply chain are like working for like few hundred dollars per month, of course. That's a regular salary in Serbia, for example. But people who are on top of this supply chain are earning billions and billions and millions sometimes, every sometimes millions every day. I think it's really hard to quantify how, how in this case, this is like Jeff Bezos, it's on the top of this pyramid. No? It's really hard to quantify how much this guy earns per month. No? So in that sense, uh, this, this job, this, this map was for, for me like really, really important. And, and in a way, it's, it's really interesting to look at this map from position of today, because this, this was done in four and two, six years ago. Uh, this is really the, the playground for AI. Because it's, it is about all of those things in the same time. It is about networks, it is about data centers, it is about extraction of, of different uh, knowledge or, or quantification of nature, but it is a lot about this. Because it's, it's a combination of, of, of people who are, who are in position to control those supply chains and to be on top of those supply chains, and to be the ones who will have those chips that are able to do this calculation. And this is like, for me, like what is like really interesting when we are comparing this situation that we have today with the situation with the internet. So people are like, you know, like 20 years ago or, or 30 years ago, it was enough to have a computer and modem to participate in, in the last revolution, no? It was possible to make your own website, it was possible to buy a domain name, this game, it's not, uh, uh, it's not possible to participate in this game, in, in game of creation of AI, because the starting point is really hundreds of millions in, or, in order to want to, to play this, this game. So in, in that sense, uh, there is a lot of uh, problematic thing there. Uh, another thing, what was like really for me, like reading this map, what was like really interesting, like when we had this discussion about ethical AI. And, and I was like always like, okay, if we speak about ethical a AI, ethical where on this map? Because like most of those discussions that we have uh, about ethical AI, it's maybe in this sphere, no? Maybe it's about data sets. It's not even about most of the time the training process itself. It is just about data set. But if we really want to make an ethical AI, then why we should not start from here? Why we should not start from, from minds? Why we should not start from elements? And try to understand why all the supply chains are not part of ethics. So for me, the, the question of AI ethics was always a bit narrow in a sense of like, okay, we can speak about that, but about which part of this map you want to speak? And, and then, after this one, uh, I was still like really uh, uh, interested in this kind of like, because in, in this like, I don't know, um, combination of different systems, because of what we have here, it's not just one system, it's many systems in the same time, so we have like, uh, system of communication that is here, planetary scale system of communication, planetary scale system of computation, planetary scale system of extraction of knowledge, planetary scale system of extraction of resources and, f and, and, and this global factory, you know? And, uh, uh, and, and the problem was like we, we are not still not able to define 
and, uh, and, and to speak about this kind of like a labor relation that exists within those systems. And, 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 and then this is something that I tried to, to address with Matteo Pasquinelli in, in this map when we try to somehow uh, visualize the creation process of, of, of one uh, AI system. So it's starting with a training data set, it's start starting then algorithms, creation of models, and then projection of this thing into the world. And, and what we try to do in, in, in this map was basically also to map different forms of biases. And, and so for example, on the left side, you know, if we start from the world and then we are capturing some image of the world and we are like, uh, um, classifying, then we are labeling this data, and so on, so on. Each of those steps are basically are bringing some, some kind of bias, because they are all done by human beings. No? So we can follow this and, and see like one on top of each other different types of biases. But then what I, I was like really interested on the right side of this map, because there is also something that we can think about it as a machine bias, because for example, in order to capture all of those images, we have a cameras in order to, 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 uh, uh, to do something with it. Every, every step, it's a different kind of bias. And then what, what you see there is basically layering of those biases, one on, on top of each other. And, but, but what was like super interesting for me, it was at the end, this kind of process of, of, of maybe, maybe this can be interesting for some of you, process of uh, uh, training comes with really application of some kind of statistical processes. And, and then I was interested like, okay, if, if all of this process is some kind of, uh, let's say, mm, compression of, of, of information into one model, so how we can critically examine different kinds of statistical processes? And, 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 and then I went, and this is something that I would maybe like to do in the future, is basically to try to critically read each of those statistical processes in a sense of like, what, what is really a meaning of, of, of using some kind of like statistical processes on, on, in, in this process, in sense of like, okay, dimensionality reduction or, or, or like fitting, underfitting and, and other processes. It's, it's always, for example, you have a situation in which I don't know, the, the anomalies are, are basically being lost. And this is the, the, the main part of the game, is basically losing all of those anomalies. And then if you apply this to the society, you can think of, okay, what are those anomalies? Am I that anomaly? You know, and then you start to think like critically or philosophically about this kind of statistical process and you realize that in deep core, it's basically some kind of totalitarian statistical uh, 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 process, because it will, it, it's always majority, it, it's al always average that is winning in this process of, 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 uh, uh, of compression. And then from there, in a way, because I, I was like, in the beginning I was like, I was mostly uh, working with like cyber forensics or with technical people, with the lawyers, uh, and, and so on and so on. But in a way, in, in order to understand how to read those maps, I needed to, to, to go more in and to work more with the philosophers, with, with different other kinds of artists or, or critical media theorists. Because, because for me, like for example, if you, if you start to investigate those systems, basically it's a, you know, different disciplines, different methodologies are giving you answers to different questions. So for example, technical analysis maybe can give you an answer on the question how something works. No? But, but in order to understand what kind of power relations, what, what kind of like a, um, form of power it's hidden there or control is hidden there, you need to apply different lenses. So it's a lenses of philosophy, it's a lenses of, of of, of media theory. And then playing with, and I spent like, for example, if each of those maps that I was showing, it's like one or two years of, of investigation, but most of that time at the end, it was about like trying to understand what is the meaning of those maps, not investigation itself. And by doing that, I was like using different kinds of like, um, reading different kinds of philosophy and, and media theory, and at the end, I, I created the map about theories about things that I was investigating. So, so basically it's this 
new extractivism movie that I'm going to show you maybe just a few minutes of it. New extractivism. An assemblage of concepts and allegories. The word assemblage is usually understood as a collection or gathering of things or people, a machine or object made of pieces fitted together, or a work of art made by grouping together found or unrelated objects. This map and accompanying footnotes are precisely that. One big messy assemblage of different concepts and ideas, assembled into one semi-coherent picture or let us say a map, a world view. 1. Gravity. Like Einstein's theory of relativity, massive objects curve the space and time of the topography of the Internet, proportionally to their weight, defined by the number of their users and content. So we can think of massive monopolies and conglomerates such as Google and Facebook as enormous black holes that, with their gravity, create a field so intense that it attracts and swallows the content and users. 2. Forces Many other potential vectors and social forces contribute to that gravitational force. The fear of social isolation, economic and professional insecurity, unrealistic expectations of efficiency and productivity in the adapt or die environment, tailored addictions, depression and anxieties. These are just some of the other vectors that constitute social forces that keep us, with or without our wish, attached to those platforms. The social cost of opting out has become so high that opting out is essentially a fantasy. 3. Black Holes Our imaginary hero is swimming against one of those platforms' gravitational force. As they glide towards the singularity defined by the mass of these giants, users and content pass beyond the event horizon, the imaginary boundary in time and space, beyond which there is no return to the outer part of this universe. The event horizon defines the line after which the social and economic price of leaving those platforms is becoming too high. No matter how fast they try to swim now, the stream will pull them towards the center of the black hole. So, so basically, but there is a, just to make a pause, like this kind of idea of gravity, for me it was like really important in a sense of like, uh, this is this, power in, in a way what they are saying it's like you are not obliged to use those things you don't need to do it you are doing by yourself whatever but in a way this this gravity you know what is the price of not participating there it's becoming so big that in a way this is this like force that is like pulling you to the the, the bottom of this but but then in one moment and i spend a lot of time thinking about these forces because it's not just amount like first logical thing is like okay the the size of this like uh, platform it's it's defining the gravity you know like in physics but but in a way what are the other things that constitute this like uh, relation that we have with them and but but then uh, Felix Stadler said like really one really good comment about this this work it's like there there is like uh, you know when you are trying to leave the earth there is this thing called esc escape velocity. So you need to spend a lot of energy in order to jump out of the gravity of this platform or, 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 or planet. But then after this, it's a bit easier. You know, after that, you can go with a little energy once you are, you are out of this. Without even noticing, this story's actor is now falling towards the hole into a new allegory, the cave. Four. Allegory of the Cave What takes place at the bottom of this metaphorical black hole can be described through Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Plato describes a group of people who spend their entire life chained to cave walls looking at a blank wall. These people are watching the shadows of real objects projected on this wall, giving them names and meanings. In our story, the script and directing of this performance of shadows are entrusted to human algorithmic machines that regulate, filter, censor and moderate the projected content on the walls of the cave. The existing elements and content that exist outside this cave and horizon of events create an information flow, a theater of shadows. 5. Walls the cave and tower walls are constructed of multiple... So basically this is some kind of, uh, uh, well, let's say, it's related probably with, uh, with this crew here. And, and these this, this walls are basically different kinds of like uh, uh, layers of untransparency. You know? so, so in my 
interpretation of this it's, it's basically this kind of cave that we are in it's built out of those walls that uh, doesn't let us to see outside of the cave no Eight layers and built mostly by ghost work or invisible labor the bricks of this structure are made of black boxes closed code and hardware glued together with the invisible network infrastructure they are covered with layers of corporate secrets patents and copyrights six the interface Interfaces are framing and structuring the projected algorithmic spectacle of images. Even though they are a direct manifestation of rules, regulations and taxonomies, they successfully obscure what is hidden beneath them. They define directly or indirectly what we can or cannot do. They are both tools and discursive frames. They are instituted as an order of discourse and embodiment of the discipline power of the platform. This cave is not only a prison cell, but it carries out the function of a factory hall and a resource extraction apparatus. The prisoner performs their threefold function as a worker, a resource and a product. 7. Shadows and Capture Agents The spectacle of a constant flow of information projected through the interface creates a digital shadow on the opposite wall of the cave. The projected digital shadow on the wall is a resource field where thousands of capture agents, tentacles of the rhizomatic surveillance complex, extract information. Every movement or emotional reaction is being recorded continuously. These capture agents can take many forms and sizes. From the tiny pieces of code, crawlers that wander the web, over the sensors catching heartbeats and surveillance cameras capturing our faces, to the complex network of satellites orbiting Earth. They can see our shadows through a full range of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can be invisible or massive like a 500 meters wide radio telescope. The process of quantification is reaching into the human affective, cognitive and physical worlds. Every segment of our existence reflected on our digital shadows, can be seen as a form of direct or indirect labor producing data as a behavioral surplus. When we breathe, walk, or sleep, every single emotion that we feel, our attention, our body temperature, or diseases that we have, everything can produce a behavioral surplus if being captured by surveillance apparatus. In that sense, even our bare existence within the walls of the cave can be seen as labor. Prisoner workers need to spend more and more hours maintaining their profiles in a similar fashion to sex workers in the windows of red light districts. Digital identity labor is the forced labor of the 21st century. This creates an auto-disciplinary society where each anomaly and misbehavior is detected and quantified. Okay, the story goes into complete madness in 36 or I don't know how many chapters, but but I'm usually not not uh, it's too much, so I'm not usually playing all of this. And and uh, but but this for me, what was like really important? We need to find the new allegories. We need to find new metaphors. We need even to find the words. We still don't understand. We we still cannot define the labor. We we still cannot define many things in this new relation that that is shaping. Uh, our lives. So, for example, what is the role of human being or user in this world of like shaped by AI and whatever? We still don't have awards, and we st but we will need to ne negotiate this position in some moment. And, and I, I think uh, this is what we should do. Uh, I will be really fast with this one. Even this one, it's probably the. This is the, the whole uh, presentation itself, or many of them. So this one is called uh, Calculating ep Empires. So Kate Crawford and, and I again collaborated on this and we work on this for four years, trying to basically not look at the surface of, of this because you know, even with anatomy of an AI, we were like diving deep into minds and whatever. But this one, it's more on the level of time. So here we explored like 500 years of, of communication, computation, classification, and control. It's not an easy task. So basically, uh, yeah, it started as a, some kind of funny um, 
project of uh, COVID project, but it ended up in, in a 24 meters of, of really condensed, uh, let's say, like uh, this. It's starting with a with a basically uh, a media architecture. So history it's starting like 1500s until today. So we are deconstructing like birth of of media as a, some kind of uh, entrance into the system. Then history of interfaces, history of communication infrastructure. That that one I really like. It's like uh, you know history of all of those things that I was investigating in the previous maps. History of data collection, information organization. Really important thing. Like how data is being organized through history, and what are the roles of museums? Because like we can speak about like museums, uh, extraction of, of information, collection of information, and so on. And then history of algorithms, history of hardware, history of, of human computers, because most of the time, like people were ones that were like doing computing. So this, is, this was a ma one map. And so that, that one is light. Then we are going on another map that I really, really it's a history of, of classification because classification, it's a core process in, in, in creation of AI. And if you go and critically understand the history of classification, you understand what we did wrong and with what we are still doing wrong because all of those like eugenics, uh, uh, um, um, this kind of like uh, scientific racism theories are still embedded in all of those systems of classification. So, but this one, it's, it's starting analyzing different kinds of like systems, like system of control of time, education, emotion, human bodies, biometrics, prison, policing, borders, bureaucracy, colonization, political, economic systems, production, earth, architecture, surveillance, and military at the end. And I'm not going to go into this because I always speak too much. This is probably for the next year or some exhibition that we are going to do. For the moment, I think this one, it's still in Berlin in one exhibition and we will do, I think, end of the year in, in Paris or something like this. Thank you. You survived the... Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Vladan. So now our panelists can come. Um, and Vladan is uh, one of our panelists. Uh, I see there's a question, but... Thank you so much. Um, and we will try to, uh, of course, keep it brief because uh, there were some uh, uh, delays, but there, is, there are drinks in um, 35 minutes, so we will try to make it brief. So um, I'm very happy to, actually, this, uh, the, uh, the, the, this panel now is going to comment and to be a bridge between art and CPDP. So we have a bit this role of going from the cover, that was, the cover is by uh, Vladan, to the rest of the program. So our, our uh, role in this 35 uh, minutes will be basically to <laughs> shift and to try how, the, how this cover is connected to the rest of the program. And um, to do that, we have uh, um, uh, two additional panelists, but they had to be three. But one, unfortunately, was um, affected by the uh, Italian, uh, <laughs> uh, let's say, uh, transportation problem, uh, transportation system. So Margot Kamiski can, couldn't come uh, here. She was flying from, uh, uh, from Florence where she's having a Schumann um, uh, scholarship at uh, EUI. Uh, and it's a bit uh, sad because uh, last year Margot had to be at our opening night, but she was not in Europe. This year she's in Europe and their flight was cancelled, but it's better, better in terms of timing. So, um, I will introduce the other, uh, well, uh, you already know Karin because she was uh, <laughs> uh, leading the first part of this uh, night. You already know me because uh, I was undeservedly <laughs> at the center of the stage before. Um, and you know uh, Vladan. So, I, uh, to keep it short, I will just introduce Clarice. Clarice Shiro is the head of data governance at OECD. 
so short introduction. <laughs> and uh, so now uh, uh, I would like to hear some uh, reactions on whatever we saw. I mean, I was extremely impressed, there's so much, and I think maybe my two cents is that abstraction is usually, we are, we are most of us scholars, policy people, and we do abstraction. And abstraction is usually not visual. And Bladen helped us today. I think this was an experiment. This is the first time that the opening night has some visuals. And uh, uh, Bladen was uh, 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 guiding us in this journey towards or back to visuals. And actually, there's so much. Of course, it's interpretation, because he had to interpret, but it's understanding. And the law is that. Law is interpretation and understanding. So uh, there's a lot that, uh, I mean, it's a hard uh, task, but to maybe just to launch a couple of provocations, uh, first to Karin, and then we go with Clarice for some rapid comments. I would say what I saw, the connection between the first page, so the, the visuals and the rest, uh, there's a lot. But from my biased perspective, I would say transparency, understanding these black boxes, connecting the a chain, the uh, supply chain, digital supply chain, with the data and with training and visualizing it beyond black box. But it's also uh, the importance of language interpretation and the importance of individuals. That's why we called this final part of the opening, uh, what's the role of individuals in the AI discussion? Uh, because Vladan allows individuals to understand and this uh, individual, uh, this um, uh, accessibility to individuals and maybe to vulnerabilities of individuals, because this is a topic very dear to me. It's maybe the key of this exercise. So I would like to start with Karin with some minutes. Uh, you don't need to, uh, to, to, to build so much. And then we go with uh, Clarice. <laughs> so first, we had a lot of Italians. And tonight, men, yes. Italian men. And we have two French women. So <laughs> it seemed like we inverted. So I didn't see. I didn't see your work before, so indeed I see transparency in it. What I also see is, despite all these links, is a lack of accountability. And another point, which I think was clear also in, in, through all the maps, if there is a connecting dot, it's a human component. And the fact that precisely it is uh, when we talk about AI, we just talk about AI systems while we should talk about how AI is designed, how AI is used, how, how it is deployed. So there are human beings behind, and there is um, the issue of where is the place of the human in the AI revolution. That's what I would see, and this is a connecting dot also, to the policy questions that we have, because policy in Europe is about democracy and the human should be at the center. And we should also protect our values that we find, for example, in the European, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And if I have to link it to the EU Act, I hope, I mean, for example, this is what CADP will really look at. We will be mapping current issues with the EU Act under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and we will also look at the Council of Europe Convention on Human Rights, also in link of the Council of Europe Convention on AI. And so another point I would see in these maps are classifications, and this is something we also do in law. We classify things, we just don't just, we don't just define, we do legal definitions. And with legal definitions, we include and we exclude. And what we see, for example, with the EU AI Act is through the definition of AI systems. We, we don't just define AI systems, we define what we will be regulating and what will be set aside. With the scope of the EU AI Act, we also say what we will be regulating and what we, we won't be regulating. So definitions are key. And because it is linked to a legal regime, so we have now with the EU Act different legal regimes. So it's a risk-based approach, but what is this risk-based approach? It basically means that we reduce, by and large, regulation to high-risk systems. 
The others have transparency obligations, but we know we have already algorithmic transparency in the GDPR, for example, perhaps more extensively. So um, we, with a risk-based approach, we reduce the, our level of regulation with a distinction between AI systems and AI models. We distinguish two legal models, two legal regimes, while in the end, maybe general purpose AI could have been regulated under the risk-based approach, but we wanted lighter obligations. So we have on the one hand AI system and a high risk AI systems. On the other hand, AI models with not much. And we found and subtleties with AI models with systemic risks, which is a kind of lighter version of the legal regimes which will apply to AI systems. And we complexify it with one more layer, which means that AI systems can be embedded into AI models, can be embedded into AI systems, in which case the AI system legal regime would apply. And all these circumvolutions of definition are classi and classifications were made in order to reduce or exclude regulations based on policy preferences of some states and with perhaps a lack of transparency. And we will see how we will manage to implement all these rules, but for sure, CADP Europe will be involved in ensuring a human-centric operationalization of the EU Act through a rights-based approach and plugging not only the GDPR, but the Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's it. <laughs> Uh, maybe just to, to to respond rapidly, I think we would need Bladen for the AI Act to to visualize all the complexity there and to understand it. Maybe it will take three or four years, but at least it will be helpful for us. Um, and now uh, let's go to Clarice. <laughs> it's a really tough job. Um, I think we're officially outside uh, working hours, right? So there will be very personal uh, comments from me. I think more than than work-related comments. Um, just the reason why I was very happy with this invitation um, is that um, we mentioned that during the prep call, but actually my mother was an artist. And, uh, and so I'm actually the product of uh, two families, a very artistic side and a very scientific side, and I land in law in the middle. I don't know why, but, and well, actually, maybe there's an explanation why. You need a bit of creativity to be a lawyer and you need some scientific rigor. So maybe, I mean, that's maybe the explanation, I don't know. But what really struck me uh, in your presentation, all your work actually, and in the work of what my mother was doing, is really um, that you put a lot of yourself in it. It's just not the regular work that we do. Like, you put a lot of yourself in your work. We all do, because you don't land in privacy and in, uh, in, in the defense of fundamental rights without believing in what you do. But still, artists put something else. It's like, it's nearly physical, right? It's uh, what you spend the amount of time and energy you spend in your work is, is immense. And when people don't like your work, um, don't like your art, it's like they don't like you. So it's very brutal. No, it's very, I mean, I, I can see that, you know, very often uh, at home. And so, um, no, it's true, it's true, it's true. It's a very lightly spread. And so when I read in, in this, it's all in, in black and white. It's beautiful design. I love the drawing. Uh, I love everything about it. Um, there's still fundamentally an anxiety a, a fear that we're losing control. Um, I think this is what your work shows. And um, I think if we then go back in, more into the professional side of things, um, I think there is a duty, a collective duty of um, governments, regulators, industry, everyone to address that anxiety. And because when you work with um, you know, a lot of people involved in these AI discussions, it is true that even the most the best professionals sometimes confess they don't really know where we're going on something. And so that creates anxiety. And it is very important to make sure that um, this anxiety is addressed because it's a fair, it's a fair one. And at the same time, um, this afternoon, I was um, moderating a panel on, sorry, it's a, you know, again, I'm sort of, it's free, right? So just moderating a panel on the use of um, health data for secondary use of health data for, um, uh, research in the public interest and and you know at the OECD there were lots of people of course a lot of the discussion turned around AI and 
how much you know, belief you know, health professionals had in the thought that this could help massively cancer research, you know, um, ultimately in diseases. It's, it's just there was so much optimism and, you know, AI for good is something that we tend to forget about. And so our duty here, and, and I think this ties in well with the coming uh, days, um, you know, of the conference, is we will be looking into a lot of the issues where we're, we'll be striking a balance. How do we do the best so that you know, future generations have a, a future you know, that we look forward to, and, and ourselves also very selfishly in a way, um, and we can do away with the risks as much as possible, knowing that it's human nature, zero risk does not exist. I do not believe in that, and so we will have more of these uh, exchanges all the time, and we need multi-stakeholder conversation, and that's why personally, although of course representing an international organization, you would think you know, I represent governments in a way, I think it's very important to engage with civil society and academia. To me, you're very much part of that crowd. So anyway, thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Clarice, and uh, thank you for bringing your personal life, personal history, because I think, I think this is another challenge that art is uh, bringing to the table. That uh, uh, we think at uh, law as an abstract thing, and we think at the data subject as an abstract subject. We think at the consumer as an abstract consumer, but actually it's lives. It's a situated subject. The interpreter is not the, in the interpreter, but is someone that is reading the law. The judge is not the judge, but is someone that is interpreting the law. And in particular, the legislator is not a legislator, but is a specific human that is uh, making decisions. So thank you for bringing this. And before giving the floor uh, back to Vladar for reaction to comments if he wants, but uh, I will now play a bit the role of uh, Margot that is not here. <laughs> and so um, Margot uh, um, is, um, Kaminsky wanted to build on something that was, is also very dear to me and connected to this discussion, uh, and is uh, the role of individuals in the, uh, in the AI legislation. So we talk a lot about uh, stakeholders and actors, right? Uh, deployers, developer, and then we have in other uh, digital laws, we have business users, we have uh, uh, gatekeepers, etc. And it's very important to tackle, to address the power dynamics there. What's the role of individuals uh, in the AI Act? It, it was a bit under discussed. The European Commission proposal was not so vocal on the roles of individuals. Now there's more. There are at least three points, I think, in which we see the role of individuals. Uh, in the in the AI Act, so bringing this to more to the legal and policy, so to the other pages of the of the book. Um, one is this new, very open to interpret uh, right to explanation in Article eighty six. Uh, what is the relationship? And and uh, you know, looking at this visual might be a form of receiving explanation. Of course, uh, you were showing us the training, how the training works, and now biases can be at the different level of training. Uh, we didn't have a, an explicit right to explanation and the, uh, in the GDPR. This uh, opened the debate of uh, 15 papers in, uh, to which I also contributed. But now we have something called right to an explanation, Article 86 of the AI Act. What do we do with that? What's the role of individuals in understanding it? Do we have an abstract individuals in understanding explanation or should it be situated to the specific audience? This is an open discussion. We are not giving answers this night, I guess. Uh, second point, very interesting, uh, is human oversight, Article 14. Uh, so the need to look for human oversight on AI. And actually, in your, uh, in your design, in your uh, visual, human oversight was something that was not always a tissue. So you, we had many humans, but maybe not really human oversight. The last thing, and this brings uh, to the conclusion of, this, uh, uh, of my two cents on this, it's... Uh, stakeholder participation in the design. This is also connected to fundamental right impact assessment. Uh, so we just published this, uh, this, um, this paper on SSRN and multi-stakeholder participation, Margot and I, in which we try to look at the role of participation of individuals in design, in decision making. Consent is not enough because it's too late. Um, uh, accountability due this per se uh, lack of uh, agency of individuals. So why don't we ask individuals to participate in the design? So not just the design uh, in the artistic sense, but the design of law and design of legislation. So uh, before giving the floor to questions and uh, interactions, uh, I would like to say if Lada wanted to react to our comments uh, or uh, uh, something to add, otherwise we go with uh, uh, either a very, very sec short second round and or with questions. Yeah, Maybe go on. <laughs> Uh, 
maybe even not so good to, to defend the position of art and artists and, and because I, for a long time I didn't consider myself uh, being one, so. But, but anyway, I, I and, and this, this is also really cliche, uh, art, uh, if you go around art conferences, so the topic of uh, algorithms, algorithmic transparency was topic of Transmediale 2012. Topic of labor was much more before that. Topic of, of uh, exploitation of earth was maybe 2014. So my, you know, really friendly tip is like, take an eye on what's going on in, in, in critical media art because it, it's really literally always like five to six years before it comes to legislation, it comes to whatever, because like artists have that kind of like, uh, you know, hypersensitivity on a lot of things that are happening in this world. And, and regarding the, the anxiety and, and we, we, we can be, in, uh, you know, like anxiety, it's reaction probably on something, but, but we don't know, no? We don't know anything. We don't know what is the data set of chat GPT-4. We don't know 4.3.5. We have some kind of tips around it. We don't know what is going to be the impact of those technology on, on the world. We don't know how many people are used for training. How we don't know what are the rules of, of we don't know. So it's, it's completely, uh, uh, and we are using those technologies as a moderator of, of and, 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 and new machines of new revolution, industrial revolution that is going to bring, I don't know, to what. We basically don't know how they function and they're functioning behind the walls. So I think any anxiety that's coming from that position, it's like really, okay, no, I mean, in a sense, I think it's like, we should try to, we should try to do it. But another problem, it's like, what, what is our constant problem? It's that we are jumping from one trend to another trend. So we didn't solve the problem of algorithmic transparency that was probably the hit question a few years ago, no? And now we are in another problem. So we are jumping from one problem to another problem and becoming experts for, for, of one field to another field without really often solving any of those problems on the way. And this is not also because of us, it's also because of the industry that is going so fast and that is really some kind of like a, a, a concentration of power of capital and they are making this pace. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, some kind of like, a, yeah. There's an alarm uh, random that is uh, uh, nudging, <laughs> it's not uh, organized. But uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for, for bringing this, like the level of abstractions that technology is bringing towards these complex systems. And th the, more the, com the, the more complex, the, war the, the more difficult for us is to uh, penetrate this complexity and uh, play a role. Uh, ju also just enforcement, right? Play individual rights. How can we really have uh, our own uh, individual rights exercised if there is such a level of uh, uh, infrastructure that we cannot grasp? So, um, I will um, go to, uh, so I, I, I see, I, I count, I usually count when I moderate, I count the people in the room, and this is a new room, <laughs> so I saw we, we, you are at least 160 now. You cannot see because this room is really, uh, um, uh, how to say, privacy friendly, <laughs> because I think you don't see uh, anything else from your bench. But uh, just to say, what's the role of individual? Uh, now it's the role of all individuals to ask questions or comments, I'm sure you might uh, you might have so I would like to devote uh, and I'm sorry to the panelists for, for stealing uh, more uh, rounds but uh, to devote uh, uh, this time to some questions uh, on which they can uh, react so I see Lex Zard from Leiden <laughs> I know him <laughs> but <laughs> Like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. Um, Vladon, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, what you do is uh, fascinating. Uh, I have worked um, 
on the, the, the anatomy of AI and atlas of AI before. And I've been fascinated before by all these things that you showed us. Um, it's, it's just great. Um, you know, Jean-Claude, you mentioned the, the abstract thinking. M for me personally, I think this is the best way to understand something to visualize. So it has helped me a lot. Um, uh, there was one thing that I wanted to address, though. I think that the allegory is very powerful in general, but uh, that's why we have to be careful in, in some, some cases. One thing that popped up was the, the comparison with gravity, uh, which is um, the uh, gatekeeper platforms um, giving somehow the, 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 the allegory or the connection with the force of nature, and I think it's a very... Um, uh, yeah, dangerous, a dangerous place. And although we can imagine it as that there is a human need or human desires that have some sort of sense of gravity, but placing of those uh, companies there and providing those uh, technologies, um, maybe it's better just a suggestion to uh, see them as constructed as gates or uh, in so some uh, other way rather than black holes because it gives them this sense of inevitability which is uh, somehow uh, constructed. And I, I was very curious if you could tell us what are you working on now? Uh, because you, you shared all these things that you have done but I'm very curious yeah. to know what's uh, in front of us. Thank, thank you. Maybe before yeah. your uh, answer, just to understand if there are uh, any more questions and uh, so that we understand how much time we have. There's one here. Okay, so you can answer, then we give the floor to more questions. Yeah, uh, I think I think they are the, so the reason why I like so much and and I I'm I'm really and this is the, the this kind of really artistic po position of like that you don't you don't feel so much responsible for for it. So if I'm a lawyer, I will never probably use those like uh, um, if I need to define my more seriously this. But it is really good to because if you if you look at now like you have like. A, I don't know, like um, Shoshana Zubov called this like uh, surveillance uh, capitalism. Then you have uh, another term, it's maybe feudalism or it's this or this, but then everyone is playing with trying to define how we can call this relation, you know. So, so I'm in that world just throwing the, the, the possible like way to think or maybe like Zizek, like to break things in a, in a way, a mental space, so you can think about something else. So, so in a way, I, it, it's a play. Uh, but so what I'm working on now, I, we just finished this uh, uh, calculating empires, and I'm really like we spent like intensive four years on on, on like uh, doing that one. So I'm trying kind of to recover of of, of that, uh, and it goes now around exhibitions and stuff like this. So I need to to take care of that. Uh, but topics that I'm like really interested in now, one, it's maybe related to, to this new extractivism craziness, is like we are creating some kind of like a, a new dictionary with some really, you know, interesting new words and new illustrations. And then another thing I'm really super interested in, uh, in, in how we can in, in psyops is a topic, like because like living in Serbia, I, I realized that you know most of the time that this person who is running our country is basically doing some kind of mass psyops operation. So I, I'm trying now to, and it's the the topic of psychological operation. It's basically really starting to to resonate in the fields of arts, in a sense of like um, we understand this as a as a as a really important topic. So. Something like that. Great. Um, then we go to the second question, and and then uh, uh, be ready because I'm uh, asking you a final one minute uh, uh, closing to both of you. So the second question there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my name's Stephanie Perrin. I'm from Canada. I'm here representing uh, Interledger Foundation, and I, I was wondering. First, I'll give you the question, but I also have what I think is <laughs> an important comment. I, I'm going to flip that around. I'll do the comment first. Mm -hmm. I, this is so important. Anyone who's had to analyze what is actually happening, whether you've been doing an audit, whether you're doing a privacy impact assessment, human rights impact assessment, you need to visualize. And I don't know about you, but my grandchildren can draw a better diagram of a house than I can. And what the companies give you 
everything, you run into the black boxes all the time. You run into the, the cutoff ramps where they go off to nowhere because they've already done the risk assessment uh, that Karen was mentioning. They've decided this is not important. You don't know whether the minority people were in the room when that risk assessment was done. So you don't know who's being impacted and deemed unimportant. Mm -hmm. So this is absolutely brilliant and uh, I think more and more artists should get into this because it's through art that we, we learn human impact. And uh, I think I've been looking for this. Now, finally, the mm -hmm, question. Mm -hmm. Have you done this for the financial system? Because I'm trying to map out finances and build, hopefully, a privacy and ethically aware uh, revolutionary payment system. How do you do that? Because it's nothing but black boxes. And it's not a field that data commissioners have really played around in very much. They take the security protocols and leave it at that. But I keep looking under rocks and finding nothing. So please, next year's project, finance. Following Payment the money. Systems. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. And what, what, what I'm, yes, the short answer, it's, it's mm, no, I didn't think of, of doing that because I, I really don't think I d don't understand finance at all. Like a minimal, I'm really bad in, in finance. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But the, just for a second, to back to the topic of, of maps, I really don't know why uh, people are not doing it more. I really don't understand, because the, what we are speaking about here, it's a complex, immense complex systems that are part of everything, of AI, of, of, of moderation, of Facebook, whatever. It's a super complex systems that, that I think the only way to do it is through the map. It, it, there is no any other way. How you can going to read about this in form of what? The most boring text in the world. No, you need, we, I think the only way to communicate complexity that we live in is through, through, through mapping. And, and, and I really don't understand why people are not doing it more often. <laughs> or how, yeah. Because people the majority shy away from complexity. Just I know, but there, there is a pr th that's problem, that's a problem very easy plain in complexity. Explanation. It's very easy. Um, and, and the thing, yeah, even if they give us like the list of one million, uh, for example, algorithms that are being there, we haven't, what we are going to do with this? You know, like how we can even, anyway, but the, the mapping, it's like the way to, to do, to to see systems as systems, not as a uh, one trillion individual parts. They are systems and they should be visualized as a systems and understood as a systems and critically observed as a systems. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I must say, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, this was an experiment, of course, and I'm super uh, impressed by how this experiment is working. Uh, I think why CPDP was so successful in the last uh, 17 years uh, was because it created the new platform for translations. And what we are doing here is translating languages, different languages. So CBDP was a translation between law, the protection law, policy, industry, design, computer science. And here we are trying to do this uh, translational experiment, thanks to you. Uh, I was a bit skeptical at the beginning. What, will it work, will it not work? But actually, it's creating a new, a new thread here. So, uh, since we have five uh, final minutes, I would like to give uh, one minute and a half to Karine and to Clarice uh, for some final remarks on this uh, uh, journey uh, of today. And then uh, uh, we, yeah, Karine. <laughs> in the spirit of uh, fi finishing with a collaborative spirit, actually, I would say that art, um, artists, I think, are getting the pulse of a society. So they sometimes see problems before us. And uh, I'm not sure it's just about anxieties. Arts is also about hope. And we hope that we can govern AI. And actually, I'm not sure. If you think that it is about anxieties, I wonder what happened to the EU Air Act, which is based on the notion of risks. And risks is an anxiogen 
uh, notion by excellence. So I think that here we're looking at risks in order to make sure that there are opportunities creating by AI because otherwise there are no really opportunities, which is the reason why we shouldn't oppose innovation to human rights. Because since the Enlightenment in Europe, we do not have innovation without thinking about the betterment of the human condition, which means that the two are absolutely not opposite. And we shouldn't sacrifice our human rights for the sake of so-called innovation, which wouldn't be really innovation. So with regard to um, individuals, the place of individuals, I think what we will have to look at with the EU Act is a slew of delegated acts, but also standardization. We know that the process of standardization in EU law has never been equal in terms of involvement of different stakeholders. It is in the, in the hands of industry. It is great that industry is involved, but civil society or academics usually do not have a real say. They're not decision makers in this process. So this is something we will be looking at. And at CIDP Europe, I can tell you that if the standards are not respecting the letter of the EU Act, we will attack them, or we will find members of parliament which will attack them. The same goes for delegated acts. And as far as oversight is concerned, I think a key point will be the governance framework and the enforcement of the EU Act. And in this regard, one of the key points that we will be looking at is the independence of the AI, the agencies in charge of AI. Because what we see is that, yes, in the Dutch case, we know it's a unit in the Data Protection Authority. So it is an independent authority. But if we look at, for example, Spain, they made the distinction between functional independence and organizational independence because basically it depends on the minist economy ministry and digital ministry without even involvement of justice or fundamental rights ministries. And I don't think you can really have functional independence without organizational dependence. So these are some of the key issues we will be looking at. And to conclude, I would say that if you want to discuss about these topics and continue the converse, conversation with us, we are organizing a workshop, not a panel, a workshop on Thursday at 11.50. And everyone is welcome to give their input because what we will be looking at is the next policy actions we can take together to make sure that the operationalization of the EUA Act is human-centric. Thank you. Clarisse? <laughs> I don't really know what to say after all of that. Um, it's like, it sounds very much like a conclusion. Um, a comment just on what you, you just said. So I worked for the French Data Protection Authority during many years. Um, that's gone now. But um, just a comment that independence, it's very hard to assess in practice. And so don't, don't judge too quickly at first, I'm not giving you lessons in independence, but just to say um, it's a very complex matter. And, and you can have a, 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 an organization that is perfectly independent on paper, but has zero funding, or does not have enough members appointed to have quorum, and then your authority is nothing. And you're better off with an agency that is not totally independent on paper, but that, that has very strong-minded, um, you know, um, strong budget and, and will do actually a better job than something. It, I mean, I'm sorry, it's very pragmatic. It's not principled, but it's, uh, it, it's going to be a very tough uphill battle, I think, for, for the DPAs, uh, for the regulators uh, under the AI Act. Anyway, uh, so just a, a, quick, a quick comment. Um, maybe, I'm sorry, I'll be very uh, hands-on, like, you know, to give you hope since we, we have to provide we need hope. That. Um, yeah, no, no, it's fine. There's plenty of hope, actually, if you start looking. Uh, so I'm not the head of the AI unit, right, at the OECD. I'm the head of the Data Governance and Privacy Unit. And, um, uh, like, a bit more than a year ago, I went to my colleagues down the hall and told them, you know, guys, um, your work is going to be a lot about privacy very soon. Like, yeah, but we cover privacy. You know, data is covered, it's in the AI principle. I'm like, yeah, but I think the wave is coming, like there's something is coming. 
in privacy, it's all about AI now. It's not CPDP AI. Everybody is like AI, you know, it's like, it's all about AI. Um, the, the privacy regulators, the, the DPAs are looking at AI. It's coming, it's gonna be big and the age of regulation is upon you and it's going to change fundamentally the way you work. It will impact, words will become important because they will delineate the perimeter of legislation. It's, it's gonna be a very different job you're going, you're going to do. And so we, and we anticipated that in a way and created a joint expert group on, on AI data and privacy to make sure that we connect the dot. And, and I think it's, um, it's an experiment. It's, uh, it's, it's been quite something to, to, um, to put together, uh, but it's a lot, it's very interesting. And I can't judge a number of, uh, of experts actually are, are uh, here today. Um, I can tell you that within the organization already, it has changed the number of mindsets and approaches, and we're looking at each other differently. We connect better, and that actually irrigates the work of the government in both cases. So, see, I wanted to finish on the message of, uh, of hope. Thank you so much. We needed that. And so, yeah, thanks to all of you. We were, you were here for two hours and uh, 15, but we promised to finish in time. It's uh, in time, more or less in time now. Uh, so we have now cocktails at Brasserie de la Seine that you can find here on the map, uh, offered by Privacy Salon and the Brussels Privacy Hub that I have the honor to co-direct. So just a round of applause to our great uh, finalists and uh, enjoy. Enjoy this intense three days. <laughs>